begin, begin our next session continuing with the Center Applied Research Projects. Just one second. All right. Up next, we have Dr. Don Boyer from University of Texas Medical Branch, then Dr. Chris Vitek from University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, and lastly, Dr. Doug Watts from University of Texas El Paso. Please share your screen to begin, Dr. Boyer. I can see you already have. Okay. C can you hear me? Yes, you do sound fine. However, you're showing your presenter screen, Dr. Boyer. You might try to switch to a different screen. Okay, let me see what I can do here. Uh... You may be able to change um, through the display settings arrow on the top left part of your screen. On the top left? I believe so. Maybe try that. Um, there you go. Slot presenter view and slideshow. OK. Is, it, is that better? I don't, I don't believe it's changed yet. Uh, is saying my screen sharing is paused. <laughs> okay. let's, let's see what's happening here. That's it. There you go. Okay. All right. Well, thank everyone for being so patient. So uh, today I'm going to talk about our tick and tick uh disease surveillance uh, group. Um, so I, I want to start out with what when we uh, initiated this, we had uh, two specific aims. And our first specific aims, we wanted to fill in the gaps of current knowledge of uh, the geographic distribution of Amblyona americanum and other Amblyona species ticks and their pathogens. And, and we focused this on primarily uh, three species of bacteria, Rickettsia, Ehrlichia, and Anaplasma species. And the viruses we focused on were Heartland and Bourbon virus. And we also wanted to improve the uh, diagnostic technologies for tick-borne pathogens by working with uh, Tom, Chi, Light, and, and Bruno, which we do have that uh, going on also. But I, I kind of want to focus on specific aim one for, for the presentation. So for our, our uh, recipe, per se, for uh, looking for ticks and tick-borne pathogens, we would collect and identify ticks split ticks into two halves. On one half, we would do both RNA and DNA extraction to look for the rickettsial bacterial agents. And the RNA, would, we would look for uh, known and unknown viral agents. And, and what we would also do is, is preserve uh, half the tick to go back to be able to culture uh, rickettsial and, and, and uh, virus samples uh, from, from the positives. So one of the things when we initially did this, it was a, a fairly small group of, of just uh, UTMB and, and Texas A&M with uh, myself, Dr. Thanglamani, uh, Pete Teal's lab at, the, uh, at Texas A&M University. And we did our initial collection at, at a, one of the local state parks. But we then, over the subsequent years, we have been trying to grow the surveillance into a, a, a large group that encompasses both uh, academic and, and public health. So we, we partnered up with uh, Harris County uh, Public Health Mosquito and Vector Control Division, uh, where we did some uh, 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 surveillance together. We then part, uh, the next year we partnered with uh, University of Oklahoma uh, Oklahoma City County Health Department, Texas Animal Health, uh, UTRGV, UTEP. Uh, and, and again, we have been partnering. And this year, we've also added uh, uh, University of Arkansas at Monticello, uh, Oklahoma State University, University of North Texas Health uh, Science Center, and uh, with also with Sunny Upstate. And I know there's like, well, this is not a, a Texas institution, but Dr. Thanglamani uh, moved his lab, but he, he's um, what I refer to as an honorary Texan, and he still uh, collaborates with us on several 
projects. And and uh, we've added um, uh, the Texas Department of State Health Services, and we we want to get more more collaborators. So we want to become truly a, a, a regional center in, as far as looking at tick and tick-borne diseases. With the subsequent growth of the of the group that we've had, and and this is sort of a, a current uh, current roster of, of the group that we've had. Uh, with this group, we think that now we have a good mix of academic research, and we have a good mix of of public health research. And you can see I've highlighted that by with the academic research being in the in the blue and the public health being in the in the yellow. So we have a good mixture of 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 um, interested parties to be able to give us a a a wide range and and viewpoint in in looking at the the problems. Uh, uh, we have basic research we have in the in the case of Mike Allen. Mike is responsible for analyzing uh, uh, the ticks from the state of Texas uh, that have been captured off humans looking for for human human uh, diseases. I mean, I'm looking for tick diseases from humans. Uh, and, and we do more questing and more animal work. So we are able to come together and, and, and uh, focus our our resources and, and ideas. We also have the educational part. We have the students in our, our various labs. This year, we've had a couple of interns this, this past summer with uh, Linda and uh, Taylor, and they're, they're gonna be presenting some data uh, somewhat later, but we, we have this, this large group that, uh, that has worked well together, which has been somewhat of a challenge uh, to collaborate in the, in the age of COVID. Uh, one of the things that sort of affected us is that we were we were sort of hindered from doing some of the field work due to the shutdown of some of the labs, uh, some of the restrictions um, to do field collections where we used to all pile up in a vehicle and go. Now you have to take when the parks were open, everyone has to drive individually. Uh, we even had some issues with getting reagents that we need, uh, which has kind of slowed us down. Um, but we were still we were still pretty productive. We were able to become um, uh, masters of of uh, uh, virtual conferences, and in doing those conferences, we were able to discuss our field observation and trends um, uh, because the interns were able to actually go out uh, late spring, early summer to do some collecting. Um, so we're able to have a up-to-date uh, analysis of collections and environment epidemiology. Uh, we have been able to refine our pathogen identification. Um, one of the things that, that we have noticed is that some of the pathogens that we have been looking for um, from questing ticks or from ticks collected from animals may not be some of the ticks that uh, Mike has been looking for. So we've actually talked about how we can harmonize our our uh, searches so we can later on we'll be able to overlap and in, in the data. We've shared techniques. Uh, we have uh, a couple of physicians with Dr. Walker and Dr. Bland who can give us clinical observations. So we're not looking at this as a as a isolated trend. Um, we've also been able to develop additional uh, collaborative opportunities. But perhaps the biggest thing that we've been able to do is to sort of develop future goals, um, look at what's next, where the gaps that need to be answered and to refine our, our approaches. And one way I, I want to show that how this is, has changed is, is with the refinement and modification of our specific aims. And particularly we want to look at specific aim number one. The, with the original aim, we wanted to fill the gaps in our current knowledge on the uh, distribution of amblyoma and amblyoma species. But there are other ticks that are that are medically important. So in in talking with the group and, and talking with with everyone, um, we actually decided to revise the the 
specific aim to now we're looking at geogra geographic distribution of ticks of medical importance and that uh, and their associated pathogens so that allowed us to to sort of expand what we were looking for we're still looking at the uh amblyomma uh, uh species but now we're also looking at exodes scapularis dermacena rhipicephalus um, for bacteria we have look we're looking at borrelia species and francisella species and for our viruses we've expanded to deer tick and powassan virus and and we've done this um, because in, in some cases in some locales some states uh, some of the pathogens are 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 not here yet are like for example we really don't expect to see in in the 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 Houston area uh, Galveston area we don't expect to see uh, Heartland and, and Bourbon virus, but that's that's more of a problem in in, in northern Texas, in Arkansas and and uh, uh, Oklahoma. We would expect to see that, but now we are we are syn we have a synergy on what we're looking for, and this is all. This will also help us with with tracking of 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 uh, tracking of pathogens. It will also help with. Uh, uh, tracking and, and movement of, of tick species. So we're, we're, we're looking at that. We have also been able to, to look at this. And one of the questions that we, we wanted to ask is that how can we combine our data into a format that is beneficial for public health, vector control, and research sectors? Now, we know academically, um, Publications are sort of our the the currency of, of choice, but with the data that we combine, we want it to be able to to pr put it out in a way that it will be useful to to everyone. And this is something. This is conversations that uh, Dr. Thangla Mani and I had while he was here. We we had it with uh with uh Pete Teal, just to you know, just to discuss all of this about what should we do? How, how can we overlay this? Um, which leads into sort of where, where we're going and, and, and an idea. Um, Dr. Thanglamani, um, one of the things he did when he went to New York was to develop a citizen science program. And with this, he, he developed a, a, a program to, to where he can use active surveillance, where his lab, as you can see there on the on the left, and here's uh, Dr. Thanglamani, uh, where his lab will actually go out and, and, and do active surveillance. But there's also a passive surveillance where he has uh, uh, created this program and they've gotten a lot of media publications. And, and uh, we've been talking about it, really been talking about it a, a lot, where uh, recently, where where citizens citizens can collect ticks and send them to uh, uh, Dr. Thanglamani's lab and test them for free. And the way this is done, he has a tick submission okay. form online, to where um, Dr. Boyer, uh, you have one minute. Oh, okay. Uh, he has a um, he has a form online where, where people can submit the information for the tick. They can put information about where it was located and, and the like, uh, and they're given a unique tick identifier. From that, uh, they are sent mailing instructions where they will mail that information uh, and the tick to the lab. So with this, this, uh, the, this is just a process step that I'm not gonna go through for the sake of time, where they identify, grind, uh, extract nucleic acid, and then uh, identify the pathogen. The key part with this is that he has developed a mapping interface tool to where, and this is just for New York, where he can identify the tick species that are, are detected. Uh, he has a number of total ticks, uh, the distinct species, and what pathogen they have. And this can go down to the, the zip code level. It, it could actually go down further for that, but 
with this program, Dr. Sarah, Dr. Thanglamani has collected ticks from pretty much the whole area. But if you notice, our area is, is fairly, fairly open. So we have been working with him to use our database as part of the center and upstate. We're working on putting together this database to where we can put our information into that to where we can develop this same type of map. Uh, and again, this would be uh, useful for public health, for research, for epidemiology. Um, we would be able to overlay both uh, uh, human data, animal data, uh, data from questing ticks. And this would be useful for public health. It would help with uh, uh, deployment of resources. Um, if, you know, it would be helpful for clin clinics. It would give doctors in particular counties, if you know there's a high rate of a particular pathogen in that county, you would be able to look for it in your differential. So this is, sort of the future of where we're, where we're going. Um, and, and we saw that the early parts of it, but we are, we are working together to develop this, this database for widespread use. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boyer. And we'll take questions at the end of the session. Up next, we have Dr. Chris Vitek. All right, can you see my screen there? We can, go ahead. Okay, I think I didn't un do my video, but so you'll just have to imagine my face. Uh, today, uh, what I want to talk about are some of the applied surveillance projects that are going on in the RGV. Uh, before I get started, I just want to recognize the people that are involved, uh, specifically some of the full-time employees, uh, notably Valerie Hernandez, who's stepped up recently and, and taken on a number of new uh, assignments, and also Thalia Rios, who's been involved in some of these projects. We have some graduate students that are involved in our efforts, as well as many undergraduates that are assisting in the, some of the field work. In addition to UTRGV personnel, we have a number of local partners, uh, including the City of McCallum, the City of Brownsville, Hidalgo County Health Department, uh, the Texas Department of State Health Services, uh, CDC uh, partners, as well as people at UTMB, and some additional UTRGV people that are no longer um, at the school. So what I'm gonna be talking about are two different projects. Um, one of these is the mosquito-borne disease surveillance effort that started uh, at the beginning of the funded cycle for the wet center. Uh, and then the second of these is a more recent uh, rickettsial and ehrlichial disease surveillance effort that Dr. Uh, Boye was mentioning with looking at tick and flea populations. So the mosquito-borne disease surveillance really is about enhancing and improving capability for testing. Uh, and surveillance efforts in the RGV. Uh, this is working in conjunction with the Department of State Health Services, but they oftentimes have limitations based on resources about how many samples they can collect or test um, as or times of the year. The second component of this is just providing uh, support for local surveillance efforts in the terms of offering advice, uh, providing guidance if they have any questions about when to trap, where to trap, what kinds of traps to use, and then the third thing is in the event of an outbreak to provide support during that outbreak with additional trapping as needed uh, for surveillance and for monitoring the outbreak situation, as well as additional testing efforts during that time. Uh, luckily, we haven't had any uh, outbreaks that have required this so far. For the rickettsial and uh, tick, tick and fleaborne disease surveillance effort, this really was initiated in late uh, 2018. So it began uh, fully in 2019. It has a sort of a three-pronged approach. The first year was to conduct a field survey of fleas and ticks, um, identify them, and then test them for any of these diseases of interest. The second component was assessing a seroprevalence of these diseases in the RGV, and this is what we're just initiating right now. And then the third component, uh, which originally was supposed to be done in year three, we'll have to see how that works, was actually a clinical study where we can actually identify some of these uh, and uh, culture some of these agents uh, that are of concern. So I'm going to start with the tick and fleaborne disease study. We initiated this by trying to uh, do this field survey. We identified a number of different ways to collect ticks and fleas. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more, oftentimes a little bit more of an active effort than mosquito surveillance where you can set a trap and come back 24 hours later. 
Um, we knew from the get-go that we wouldn't really be able to have enough personnel to do fl trapping or uh, flagging and dragging in a number of different areas. So we recruited partners, a number of veterinary offices. Uh, we recruited a number of animal shelters uh, to assist in these collection efforts. And so they, well, with animals they bring in, they remove any ticks or fleas and send them to us. The veterinarians are located on red circles on this map and the animal shelters are the blue, excuse me, the blue circles. We also have uh, some field sites, some parks that we are collecting in uh, located on those green dots. Uh, some residential houses uh, in purple there. Uh, and that could either be removing animals from dogs or animals that are on that residence or actually dragging and collecting in those areas as well. We also have uh, one additional veterinarian site that's not located on this map because it's up in Laredo. And so we're getting ticks and fleas sent to us from there as well. So with the ticks and fleas that have been collected, um, the vast majority of these are from, or, or rather the plurality of these are from the uh, veterinarian and animal hospitals. We've received over 560 different ticks. Uh, most of these have been Ripicephalus sanguineus. The field sites have been rather productive as well. Uh, altogether, a little, or right around 400 ticks have been received from those basically split evenly between the residential areas and the parks where we do the dragging and the flagging. Uh, those species, uh, primary species again are Amblyoma maculatum and Ripicephalus sanguineus. The animal shelters have been pretty uh, productive as well. Again, around 200 ticks or so, um, mostly of the Ripicephalus sanguineus. The flea collection has not been quite as lucrative. Um, all the fleas that we received have been from the veterinary clinics and there's been 19 total. Most of these have been uh, the cat and dog fleas uh, that are common. Uh, and then we had one of those, I believe that's the chicken flea or the echidna, uh, Echidonophagia gallinacea. So that was sort of an interesting find. All of these specimens are, are currently uh, either being sent or have been already been sent to uh, UTMB for testing. And so we don't have any results from those yet. In terms of the species composition of what's been collected, uh, again, a, a little over 75% have been Ripicephalus sanguineus. Around 20% or so have been Amblyona maculatum. And that, again, that's primarily from the field sites where we do our own dragging and collections. We've collected a very few, a very few amblyoma mixtum and some dermacenter variabilis as well. Um, ideally, what I, one of the things I wanna do is sort of look at the distribution um, annually or seasonally on these. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we only really have one year of data. That was last year of collection. The data sort of, the collection efforts uh, were hindered significantly this year. Um, because Ripicephalus sanguinis was the most commonly one, I just sort of put a quick graph together and so you could sort of see that there's a lot of variability. Um, it looks like the tick is pretty much around all year round. Uh, that month in April, you can ignore that, that we actually did not receive any specimens there. Um, so it's not that we didn't collect anything. Uh, so that's sort of an outlier right there. But certainly it looks like there's not any, at least based on this one year of data, there's not any significant seasonal variation. Oops, there we go. Uh, so our plans for 2021, we do want to try to deploy additional flea traps in the animal shelters and we're working on uh, doing that. Uh, hopefully that will expand the flea collection that we have. We also are working as I think Scott mentioned earlier about uh, securing and testing human serological samples. We have a number of different avenues that we're pursuing for that so we can try and uh, see what we might be getting there. And we also wanna expand the field collections to include Brownsville and some further areas closer to the coast and. Uh, east of the uh, Hidalgo County, uh, that would include uh, some additional field trapping and or and or recruiting additional uh, veterinarians in that area. Now with the mosquito borne disease, as I mentioned, a lot of this is really working with local partners uh, to receive mosquito samples. Uh, so they do the collections for us. And right now we've primarily been working with three partners. This is the city of McAllen, the city of Brownsville and Hidalgo County Health Department. Uh, they've been receiving, they've been sending us samples basically since uh, 2017, 2018. We then identify those mosquitoes, test them for relevant uh, diseases. Uh, for, so for Culex, we're really focusing on West Nile virus right now. For Aedes aegypti and Albopictus, we're focusing on the dengue, Zika, chikungunya, triplex. Mm -hmm. These are the trapping sites that we have, or rather our partners have in these two different locations. In Hidalgo County, 
the trapping is uh, more uh, uh, based on con calls or concerns. And so it's, it's sporadic. We don't, they don't trap on all these sites every single time. Rather, they may trap on some of them one week, move around to other traps the next week, go back and forth and back and forth. Uh, but you can see it encompasses a wide area of the county. In the city of Brownsville, they do have these uh, BG Sentinel traps that are set up uh, and removed from on a weekly basis. We don't get data or mosquitoes from all of these traps. Rather, half of them do go to the state for identification and testing, and then approximately half of them come to us for identification and testing. The nice thing is we've actually just set up an MOU with the state to become an associated uh, testing facility and identification facility. So hopefully that will also increase our ability to receive samples from other locations as well. So a quick out, uh, summary of some of the data and results that we've been getting. As I mentioned, this was started really in the fall 2017 with Hidalgo and the city of McAllen sending us samples. They've been using light traps, BG traps, gravid traps, and aspirators, so a mix of different collection methods. Brownsville was sending us samples uh, starting in late 2018, then all through 2019, and then here into 2020. They only use BG traps, which is actually fairly interesting when you'll see some of the mosquitoes that they collect in those, in those BG traps. The numbers of mosquitoes that are collected, again, 2017, we were starting off. 2018, we had about 8,000 or so from Hidalgo County and McAllen, about 11,000 uh, just in, from the late time that the city of Brownsville was sending us. 2019, we got about 30,000 mosquitoes from Hidalgo County and McAllen, uh, about 27,000 or so from city of Brownsville. So we were all enthusiastic that everything was moving uh, smoothly and everything was good, looking good. And then of course, 2020 hit. Uh, the counties and the health departments certainly had other priorities for, uh, of concern, so their priority was no longer collecting mosquitoes to send to us, um, which I don't blame them at all for. And so uh, in Hidalgo County and McAllen, we only have to date about 210 mosquitoes have been collected. The city of Brownsville has started up some of their collection efforts again, and so we're at around 6,000 mosquitoes, but certainly we're not going to get to those 2019 numbers. Our hope is that 2021 will sort of get back up to those uh, 50 to 60,000 mosquitoes total we've collected. All data that we've collected in terms of identification and testing is sent to MosquitoNet. Uh, initially, we were just focusing on Zika. We added the triplex in 2018, and the good news is that all mosquitoes thus far have tested negative. Um, the species, our composition that we see in the two areas, there is a little bit of variability. We found about 27 different species of mosquito in Hidalgo County. Uh, in Brownsville, we found about 25 different species of mosquito. Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus, and Culex huinca fasciatus are the primary mosquitoes that we're focused on. And you can see in Hidalgo and McAllen, uh, Aedes aegypti, we've collected about 4,000 of those, which accounts for about 10% of the total mosquitoes. In Brownsville, it's about 9,000, which accounts for about 16% of the mosquitoes. Aedes albopictus, there's actually, uh, in both counties, there's a lot fewer of these and uh, they both account for about 2% of the total mosquito collection. Culex quinca fasciatus uh, in Hidalgo and McAllen, we've got about 3,000 of those for about almost 10%, a little less, about 8%. And you can see in Brownsville, Culex quinca fasciatus is about 23,000%, or I'm sorry, 23,000%, 23,000%, 23,000 mosquitoes or 41% of the total mosquito population. So the plurality of mosquitoes are Culex winca fasciatus. And remember, they're using BG traps, so they're catching all these in BG sentinel traps. This is some of the more common mosquito species that we've found. In some cases, we have uh, similar abundance in both uh, areas. So Aedes vexans and Culex nigropalpus we see significantly in both Hidalgo County, McAllen, as well as Brownsville. In other times, we see some species in one area, but not in the other area. For example, Culex coronator, we see a lot in Hidalgo County, McAllen, but we have yet to have any collections in Brownsville. Whereas Culex erraticus, we see very few in Hidalgo and McAllen, but we'd have a large number of those in Brownsville. I want to quickly point out Authoritatis felker and Sorophora columbiae there. Um, you can see Sorophora columbiae in Hidalgo, we have over 17,000 of those collected, or 43%. Same thing with Felker, we have a very large number, almost 7,000 there. Of those Thelkter, more than 2,000 of them came from one night at one site in April of 2018. So we were just happened to be collecting at the right time that there just was huge numbers of Authortata Thelkter in the region. And then the same kind of thing in 2019, we had about 4,000 Thelkter, 
more than 16,000 Columbiae and more than 2,000 Seraphora cyanescens from one night spread across four different sites in early July 2019. This actually corresponded and was a few weeks after a major rainfall and flooding event that occurred in late June 2019. And so that's probably why we saw those huge numbers at that one time. So those numbers are a little bit misleading for Hidalgo McAllen because those were very uh, sort of isolated collections. Now the flip side of the common species is sort of rare species. I find this interesting from a biological perspective. Some of these we've uh, just collected one or two specimens in on occasion. Um, all of these represent mosquito species that we have less than 0.1% of the total collection either from Hidalgo or city of Brownsville. And again, looking at these, it's somewhat interesting. Octartatus solicitans, we've only collected 53 total from Brownsville, but we have 731 from McAllen, which is more than 0.1%. Same kind of thing with Seraphora ciliata. On the other hand, Anopheles pseudopunctipennis and Anopheles quadrimaculatus, we collect a lot more of those in Brownsville than we do in Hidalgo County. Dr. V. Peck, I'm sorry, um, we've come to the end of your time. Okay, here are some fun graphs that I'll be happy to show if anyone has any questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, up next we have Dr. Doug Watts. Dr. Watts, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am, Caroline. Can you hear me? <clears throat> and we are looking at your um, title page from your presentation to let us know when to advance. So you can hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to be uh, talking about our surveillance project uh, for tick and flevo and acacia along the Texas-Mexico border and other areas of Texas. Uh, we started this project in, in August uh, 2019. Next slide. So uh, we know very little about tick-borne diseases in El Paso and the surrounding communities of Southwest uh, Texas. In fact, very, very little with only a single case of typhus reported in 2015. Why? We don't understand, but it could be due to the lack of surveillance, uh, cases not being recognized, or the absence of tick and flea borne pathogens in the area. However, we do know that Rocky Mountain spotted fever poses an imminent threat to the El Paso community because of outbreaks in northern Mexico, where the uh, brown dog tick is the only vector. Now, these outbreaks have been occurring, or at least reported since 2003 along the U.S. Uh, uh, Mexico border, including uh, 247 fatal cases in the Mexican state of Sonora. This is uh, along the border of Arizona and New Mexico. Uh, 380 cases in Arizona, including in eight counties, uh, mainly among Native American Indians, with a 10% fatality rate. And uh, 132 uh, fatal cases in Mexicali, Mexico, along the uh, California border. Next. <clears throat> so uh, more recently and, and closer to home, uh, last year there was an outbreak of Rocky Mountain spotted fever throughout the state of Chihuahua, Mexico. So 77 cases, including 25 fatal cases. And of the uh, 77 cases, 32 occurred next door in, in Ciudad Juarez, including 11 uh, fatal cases. This year, uh, we understand that there's, uh, there has been uh, 10 cases uh, reported in Juarez, including seven fatal cases. So uh, with this threat of Rocky Mountain spotted fever and our lack of understanding of tick-borne pathogens and diseases, our objectives, uh, next slide please, are to monitor the distribution and host preference of ticks and fleas in the El Paso and surrounding community to determine the prevalence of uh, our Rikeshi, our Taki, and our Reliki, uh, Shofinus, in ticks and fleas collected from domestic and wild animals, and uh, to determine the possibility of human infections by testing sure samples for antibody uh, to these uh, species. Uh, next. So these are the project participants. Uh, I'm the PI, uh, Cindy Cruz, uh, is the project director of our ecology and surveillance lab and our community outreach program. Karen Valdez is conducting a survey of fleas and ticks uh, for Rickettsia and Taffy and wild animals for serological evidence of Rickettsia 
infection in rural areas of El Paso. Abraham Villa is conducting a survey of fleas and ticks in domestic cats and dogs and humans for evidence of rickettsia and Tati infections in the urban areas of, of El Paso. Luisa Dominguez is conduct, conducting a serial survey to determine if humans were infected with rickettsia and Tati. And uh, Celeste Sanchez is conducting a survey of fleas and human blood samples for E. Shafinas. Next slide, please. Now, we are collecting uh, ticks and fleas uh, in and near El Paso and uh, also in Juarez. Uh, also, blood samples are being collected from domestic and wild animals in the same area. Dr. Ken Walworp is providing ticks, fleas, and blood samples from wild and domestic animals. Uh, Dr. John Morell is providing sewer samples from white-tailed deer and wild hogs collected in Travis County as well as ticks uh, from the uh, wild hogs. I guess you call them wild, wild boars, I'm not sure. Uh, next slide. We uh, are collecting ticks and fleas from several different sites as shown here using different methods. Uh, this is Karen Valdez uh, here. Uh, methods including uh, dragging and flagging and carbon dioxide for ticks. And we are collecting ticks and fleas by hand from uh, from dogs, uh, primarily in in Ciudad Juarez. Next slide. We're using a taxonomic key by Pratt to identify ticks and fleas. Next slide. And a nested PCR to test ticks and fleas for rickettsia and typhi. And we're using an indirect mineral fluorescence antibody technique to test serous samples for antibody to rickettsia and typhi. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, we have uh, started uh, validating our PCR assay. We sent samples to UTMB, and here are the results. Uh, this is 16 uh, highs of uh, cephalus sanguinis ticks collected from dogs in, in Juarez during an outbreak of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. All were negative in our lab, and as shown uh, in this, uh, <clears throat> this slide, uh, they were all negative at UTMB. Next. This is a summary of all testing results for 2019, showing that 52 fleas and 35 brown dog ticks were negative for rickettsia and typhi. And uh, 40 human serum samples were negative for antibody to these two Rickettsia species. These were uh, collected in El Paso, whereas in Tom Green County. Next slide. This is a summary of additional serum samples collected from wild animals during 2019, but not yet tested for antibody to Rickettsia and Typhi. Also, we have uh, archived uh, about 2,000 human sera collected from 2015 to 2018 that have not yet been tested. The uh, animal seras were collected uh, from El Paso, whereas in, in Tom Green County. Next slide. So a summary of collections during 2020, including 24 fleas, 45 brown dog ticks, some unidentified ticks from dogs in Juarez and uh, ticks from Travis County. Again, not yet tested for Arikese and Arikafi. These uh, were collected in, again in the same uh, locations. Next. Shows a, a summary of uh, 212 animal series collected during 2020. Again, not yet tested. Uh, for uh, antibody to rickettsia and, and typhi. And we just received the, the sera samples from the wild hogs from Dr. Morrell, <clears throat> uh, where he is uh, making a living, uh, helping the uh, state uh, manage and control uh, white-tailed deer and, and wild hogs. And I have a uh, and fortunate to have him uh, uh, do some 
a little extra work and collect some ticks uh, and blood samples for us. Next slide. Dr. Watts, what should the title on this slide be? I'm sorry. Uh, what should the, yes, what should the title of this uh, slide be? Summary of 212 animal cereals collected during 2020. Okay, very good. We're back on. Thank you. Are you, are you with me? Yes, we are at this time. We are on summary of 212 animal cereals collected. Okay, next slide. Okay, this uh, shows a summary of presentations due in 2020 for the project. Uh, Karen Valdez uh, presented our project data at two meetings and participated in lecture series and uh, one health course. Uh, Luisa Dominguez uh, presented her plans to survey human and deer for Rikesi and Taffy at three different meetings. Next. And this is the, uh, a summary of the status of training UTEP undergraduate biology students to identify ticks and fleas and uh, perform laboratory uh, testing techniques. Two of our students graduated last year, 2019, and we now have uh, four students, including the two special project students. Next uh, slide. We uh, continue to offer our UTEP undergraduate medical uh, entomology research course. Uh, this course is required for all undergraduate students who are conducting research under the mentorship of a full-time faculty member. Uh, we have seven students this year, usually have an average of about 15 students. The uh, course consists of weekly didactic lectures presented online with demonstrations on trap setting uh, collection procedures and vector identification. And these are the lectures shown here. Next slide. These are the uh, stipend students who participated in our first course during 2016. Uh, also, we continue to offer annual workshops to help improve, improve vector control activities in El Paso. Uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, and then Ciudad Juarez. Next. This is a summary of the impact of the pandemic on our project activities. Uh, uh, field activities impacted uh, include the following. It has not been possible to collect tick and fleas uh, in the field. With the exceptions of samples provided by Drs. Walworth and, and Morrell. We suspended plans to collect ticks and fleas uh, at the El Paso Animal Service Center. We uh, signed an MOU with them in March of this uh, year. It's not been possible to establish collaboration with CDC to conduct ecology and epidemiology of, of the Cassie in Mexico. We started this. Uh, the paperwork on this, but it was interrupted and we have not uh, uh, continued. The uh, pandemic has interrupted the following laboratory activities, uh, plans to test more than 2,000 human serum samples, uh, plans to test the uh, backlog of ticks and fleas, plans to test serum samples from domestic and wild animals for antibody to RRE, Cassie, and Tati, and uh, and to heartland and uh, bourbon viruses. Uh, it's interrupted student training projects to do research and to identify ticks and fleas and to perform laboratory diagnostic techniques for Rickettsia. However, some students are doing literature surveys for the project, but uh, are not working in the, in the laboratory. It's not, uh, not, uh, not authorized yet. In fact, today we had over 1,000 cases. It, it's, uh, the, the situation in El Paso has gone from 60 cases two weeks ago to 500, and now today, uh, oh, 1,000. So we're, we're suffering. Uh, conclusions, uh, we have established uh, the first laboratory-based surveillance program for tick-borne pathogens in, in Southwest Texas. Uh, we have not tested a sufficient number of samples needed to understand the risk, if any, of rickettsia diseases in the El Paso community. 
outbreaks of Rocky Mountain spotted fever in Juarez poses an imminent threat of the spread of rickettsia to the El Paso community. We've identified only one species of ticks, uh, Retrocephalus sanguinis, in uh, Juarez, and this same species has been reported on dogs in El Paso. Preliminary results indicated that most common flea species collected were human and sick type fleas. Uh, the collection of fleas and ticks by hand from animals has been the best collection method. Flag and dragon and CO2 traps have not been successful for collecting ticks. Adhesive traps have not been successful for collecting tea, uh, fleas. And finally, this pandemic has and continues to severely interrupt all aspects of our project. For our future plans, we uh, plan to continue surveillance in uh, El Paso County and, and Juarez and to test their uh, backlog of samples. Plan to conduct uh, extending uh, uh, surveillance to uh, state parks to use the Sky Island model for tick surveillance. Continue to verify testing results for our PCR and ISA technique. Uh, to establish collaboration with CDC in Mexico to conduct ecology and epidemiology on the KSC in Mexico. Collect and test t uh, ticks and uh, fleas from domestic cats dogs and wild animals at the El Paso Animal Center, and uh, to establish uh, Eliza to test deer and swine here for IgG antibody to Heartland and Bourbon viruses. I forgot to, to advance the slides. I hope you did so. Anyway, that's uh, well, I have the acknowledgement here. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Wallace and Morrell for providing ticks and fleas and UTMB for their continued support. And to our colleagues in uh, Ciudad Juarez, including Dr. Maria Escarcega, Dr. Antonio de la Moore, and Ernesto Rivas. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Watts. Okay, we will now take questions for Dr. Boyer, Dr. Vitek, and Dr. Watts. And I'll pass it over to you, Chris, if we've had any questions from the audience. Thank you, Caroline. Um, no questions yet. Oh, Gabe has our first question. Yeah, thanks to all the speakers. Um, I don't know who to address because you guys all touched on this similar interesting topic. Um, and this is that observation of Rifocephalus sanguineus, the brown dog tick. It's now been affiliated with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So the CDC and others have been involved in publishing those reports of epidemics in Mexico in Arizona, but Doug, you just presented some interesting data showing that either it's expanding or it's either being recognized more um, in terms of where that kind of environment is occurring and then where human disease is occurring. But I'm curious, uh, those brown dog ticks, they're very common in a lot of places. So I'm wondering about that geographic distribution, like why are we not seeing it more in other locations? Is it either not there or is it just not being recognized? So uh, this is Doug Watts. Uh, <clears throat> excellent question. Certainly a question that we are have been asking uh, in in El Paso, with uh, whereas a, a stone throw away, and uh, uh, with the major outbreak last year, and uh, and so far we have not, uh, and we have been uh, certainly. Uh, uh, checking with the city department of health in, in some of the hospitals. And, uh, we did have one case, uh, we found in a, in a hospital here in El Paso, but it turned out that this, uh, uh, patient, uh, had, uh, was living in, 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 in Ciudad Juarez. So, uh, to answer your question, I have no clues at this point in time why we are not seeing, uh, uh, cases in the El Paso community, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, the brown dog tick is here. Uh, uh, I think as uh, more as frequently as you find them over in Juarez. However, I think the the difference based on preliminary observations is that there are many more stray dogs in, in Juarez than here in El Paso. Not that we don't have <laughs> lots of stray dogs, but 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 uh, the numbers certainly seem to be uh, 
much larger over on the uh, Mexico side. Uh, so so uh, that's uh, pretty much what what I know about the situation here. However, we we you know this is a one of the main reasons we're doing this study to try to understand uh, uh, more about or to an, understand anything about tick-borne diseases here in in the community in El Paso. Hi, uh, Gabe. This is uh, Don Bouillet. Um, you know, in some cases, if 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 it's not very very severe, sometimes I think it's 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 overlooked. I have a, um, a collaborator I'm working with in in Mexico, and um, we were talking just earlier this week where uh, they sent us samples. We tested uh, from a, a Rhipicephalus sanguineus tick. It's positive for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, so when they talked to the uh, the owners of the dog, they're like, "Oh no, we didn't have Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We had dengue." So it could be some if if people don't go get screened, it could be some some mis misdiagnosis, uh, or they're they're overlooking it. And, so and I'd like to... go ahead. oh, go ahead, Doug. No, oh, no, I what like... I. You finish, okay? Oh, um, the other thing too is that there are other um, the other rickettsial diseases and, and and the way the current serology is set up, there are other rickettsial diseases that are much milder than uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So, in some cases where someone has a positive to a spotted fever group, it may not be caused by rickettsia rickettsia. It may be caused by um, Rickettsia amblyommatis, Rickettsia montanensis, Rickettsia parkeri. So, all of those could play a role. I'm sorry, Doug. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to comment about uh, uh, the observation, and I believe Dr. Dave Walker uh, brought this to my attention that the the fatality rate on the Mexico side appears to be much much higher than here on the U.S. side, and uh, I was thinking possibly that that we are having uh, uh, milder maybe cases here on the U.S. side, and like you say, Don, Don maybe going unrecognized. Uh, uh, there's no active uh, surveillance in the in the El Paso community. The only way we would be able to identify uh, uh, cases would be a severe or fatal case that would be reported to the city health department and that's the way the one case of typhus was was identified recognized it was reported to city health department they reported it to uh, the state health department in austin uh so i have uh, spent a lot of time uh, trying to find out uh, from the local physicians and if they uh, observed any undiagnosed cases uh that they would consider to be Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and the response—not uh, everybody, but what is Rocky Mountain spotted fever? Uh, anyway, uh, makes me uh, scratch my head. All right. Any other questions, Doctor Roundy? Looks like we have a question from uh, Doctor Margie Walker. I think that might be um, Dave Walker. Oh. So I'm, I'm, I don't have a question. I just want to add a little bit to the discussion. I think we're talking about looking for emergence. And I'm, this is a very big danger because when Rickettsia Rickettsia spills over into brown dog ticks, you can really get an epidemic because it, dogs can act as an amplifying host. And then Ripicephalus sanguineus maintains it transoverally and you just get a huge amount of infected ticks in a location. And that's what's happened in Mexico. And this has been described going back to the 1940s in Northern Mexico. And so the strain of Rickettsia that's in Latin America been, is more virulent than the one in the United States. One in the United States is virulent enough, believe me, but um, it's not, not a mild disease. Um, so I think what we really need to be on the lookout for is uh, Rickettsia Rickettsia spilling over into brown dog ticks in the United States, as, as occurred in Arizona on the Indian tribes. 
And that's uh, that's probably more than I uh, should be talking about at this time.